everything you ever needed to know about chemistry is in the periodic table. How many times do you say that? The periodic table, the icon of chemistry. There's so much that's embodied in that table that if you really understood it all, it seems like you'd understand all of chemistry. And the key to really getting the value from the periodic table is to understand patterns and trends. Because in addition to the way the atoms are arranged or the elements are arranged in the periodic table, you have a lot of information there about reactions, about the sizes of cations and anions. We have another poster in this room. If you can zero in on that poster a little bit, the atomic radius poster, which shows trends in the sizes of the atoms. Now, these would be the neutral atoms. And you can see that size definitely increases as you go down a column in the periodic table and as you go from right to left, the size increases. Can we see a pattern? That's a great pattern. It's a great uh, the trend in atomic radius or in ionization energy. But you can't easily measure that in the classroom. Is there a trend that we can easily see in the classroom in terms of the properties of the elements? And it turns out that in the case of the alkaline earth metals, there is. The alkaline earth metals are in group two of the periodic table, beryllium, Magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, and radium. Group two are the alkaline earth metals. They're called the alkaline earth metals for two reasons. One, when they react with water, you get alkaline solutions, basic solutions. And alkaline earth, because all of these elements are very uh, abundant in the earth, in various minerals, uh, in the dolomites, uh, which are the magnesium and the calcium carbonates, and so on. So we're going to study a trend in the chemical properties of the alkaline earth metals. I have magnesium, calcium, strontium, and barium. And if you can see on that overhead here, I've got magnesium chloride, calcium chloride, strontium chloride, barium chloride. What I'm going to do is react all of those solutions with a series of ions. I have potassium iodate, which is IO3 minus. I have sodium sulfate, which is Na2SO4, so with the sulfate anion. I have ammonium oxalate, which is the C2O4 2 minus ion. And finally, I have a, a solution of uh, sodium carbonate, which is CO3 2 minus. What I'm going to do is form, I'm going to add the cations uh, all the way across in each row. So I'm going to add magnesium chloride all across that first row, calcium chloride across the second, strontium and barium. Then within each column, that is to the magnesium, calcium, strontium and barium, in the first column I'm going to add the potassium iodate, in the second sodium sulfate, in the third sodium, uh, ammonium oxalate, and finally the sodium carbonate. So it's going to take a few minutes as I fill these wells, and I need about a milliliter in each, and and so let me just make sure I have magnesium chloride. And I want it about a third full. And I'm just going to add that to each well across in the first row. These all contain magnesium chloride. The fifth column here is going to be my control column. And so I've got about a milliliter in each. I can tell that's a milliliter because I know what each well takes. This is a popular experiment that often students would do on the microscale level. If you don't have time for the students to do it as an experiment, you can go ahead and do it as a demonstration. So in the second row, I'm going to add the calcium chloride across. And again, the exact amounts aren't critical. These are all the same molarity. That is, they're the same concentration. And they're 0.1 molar, so that was calcium chloride in the second row, strontium chloride in the third row, and again, I'm just adding about a milliliter to each. These dropper bottles make it very convenient to add that. 
If you wanted to save time with your class, you could have these all filled before you start. The only drawback to that, of course, is then the students don't really know what you've added. So, and we'll go ahead and add the barium chloride to the bottom row there. And Okay, so I'm set up. I have my four solutions and they're in that across. Now what I'm going to do is within each column I'm going to add the same anion. So in this column it's going to be iodate all the way down and this is again potassium iodate. And I need equal amounts although the amounts aren't crucial. So I'm simply going to add all the way down there in the column. So far, not so much is happening. I just have clear colorless solutions. Can you pick that up in the bottom? Well, you can pick that up. So what did you see? The first three, I did not get any reaction. There's no precipitate. In the last well with the barium, I got a cloudy solution. Can you see that cloudiness? That's a precipitate of barium iodate. What we're looking for here, sometimes it pays to, you know, as you get caught up with adding everything, to ask yourself, okay, remember, we're going to look for a pattern. Just as we saw a pattern in the sizes there, we're going to see if we get any pattern in terms of where we get chemical reactions. In the second column going down, I have sodium sulfate. Always helps to check what you're doing as you get, um, and again, add the sodium sulfate. I'm going to add to the same level. That makes it easy to know that you added about the same amount in each. Okay, do we see anything there? Any evidence of chemical reaction in any of those? Where did we see a chemical reaction? Do you see the cloudiness? Two of the wells are still clear. Two of them are white and cloudy, kind of milky. We're getting a precipitate that uh, deposits out there. So with the sulfate, the strontium and the barium formed precipitates of strontium sulfate and barium sulfate respectively. Ammonium oxalate, I'm going to go ahead and add that to all the cations going down a column here, the third column. One, two, three, four. I think you can begin to see the pattern there. It's almost a geometric pattern. And finally, in the last one, um, I have the sodium carbonate, and I'm going to add the carbonate going down to each one. Now I've kept that last column uh, was just our control column. What is the pattern? What are we looking at? What have we learned? Is there anything here in terms of a trend? a periodic trend in the properties of the elements. Well, let's just ask ourselves, which cation, remember what we want to look at here are the, is the trend in the properties of the alkaline earth metals. So we want to compare, now we didn't use beryllium and we didn't use radium. So we used the four most common, which are here, magnesium, calcium, strontium, and barium, okay? What is the trend? Well, which metal cation formed the fewest precipitates, that is, had mostly soluble salts, the magnesium. Because if we look across a row, notice that magnesium only formed a precipitate with one anion, that is the carbonate. In all the other cases, iodate, sulfate, uh, oxalate, and carbonate, in all of the others except the carbonate, there was no reaction, there was no precipitate. So we're looking at a trend in the solubility of the metal salts that were formed. So magnesium for, had the, was the most soluble in terms of its salts because it only formed one precipitate. Which cation formed the most precipitates? Well, barium, right? Because barium formed a precipitate with every anion that we added. So if we look across that bottom row there, barium chloride formed a precipitate with iodate, sulfate, oxalate, and carbonate. And of course we see that there's a very regular trend. So we had one precipitate for magnesium, two for calcium, 
three for strontium and four for the barium. So did we get a trend and is it a periodic trend? It turns out it's actually related to the size trend that we noticed here going down. If we look here at magnesium, calcium, strontium, and barium, they get progressively larger, okay, in terms of the size, although the strontium and the barium are pretty much very similar in size. The trend is that as you go down a column in the periodic table, the salts become, as general trend, less soluble. And that's because as the cations get larger, they are not as easily solvated hydrated by water molecules in solution and so they tend not to dissolve because the driving force for a salt to dissolve in water is hydration, water molecules surrounding those ions because you can't have free floating cations or anions. They have to be surrounded by water molecules. In the case of the magnesium cation, a small cation, easy for water molecules to surround and essentially dissipate some of that negative charge. And so the magnesium is the most soluble, the barium is the least soluble because the barium is the largest. So a periodic trend in the solubility of the alkaline earth metals mirrors a periodic trend in the atomic radius of the alkaline earth metals. And again, bringing it all around full circle here, what we're really trying to do is get students to understand some of the tremendous chemistry that is embodied in that chart on the wall in every classroom. It's more than just the elements arranged in increasing atomic number. There are important things that we learn about the properties of the elements based on their position in the period periodic table and trends within a column, which are called a family. The alkaline earth metals are a family and, of course, across a row as well. So uh, this is a popular experiment, but it's also a great way to demonstrate it doesn't take very much and gives you a visual of the periodic trend.